Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the GSMA APAC conference and this session on the new mobile economy. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and a big thank you also to our, our sponsors, Tacoma Digital, for their support in helping shape the session today. My name is Brian Gorman. I'm the FinTech lead from the, uh, from the GSMA. I'm delighted to say we've got a, a fantastic uh, array of speakers with us this afternoon to both share their thoughts on some of the, the trends in the mobile economy and the things that are powering the use of mobile, but also their insights on really interesting propositions that they're working on and either live in market with or, or shortly will be. So very excited. Uh, big thank you uh, to Filippo, to Daniel, to Rajesh, Trevor, to Abby, and also Rosalia. So as you can see, we've got a very busy session, so I need to crack on. But just by way of an introduction, uh, we've got a mixture of presentations and fireside chats today to, to explore the proposition. So hopefully a really good use of your time. I'm really appreciative uh, of you joining us today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome my, my first guest on stage, uh, Filippo Giacci from uh, Decomo Digital. Thanks very much for, for joining us, and indeed, thank you very much for your, for your kind sponsorship. Uh, perhaps I could ask you to start off just by giving a, a few introductory words about uh, Decomo Digital, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, hi, Brian. Pleasure to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so um, we are Docomo Digital. That is the payments division of Entity Docomo of Japan. So we are part of the incumbent telecom of Japan. Uh, within that, we are a tech division. So we run a global payments business. The division headquarters is in London. We have global offices in all the regions. And uh, we predominantly do two things. So we have one merchant business, uh, whereby we uh, transact, uh, well, we process transactions uh, on behalf of merchants, or the large app stores, video, and music streaming providers all work with us in directly or indirectly um, globally. And the other business that we have, which is uh, also quite large, is a uh, um, software as a service business. Uh, so in short, we provide platforms to uh, telecoms for them to manage their payments businesses, um, mostly current billing. So these are our, our two business lines. Fantastic. Thank you. And as you mentioned, uh, mobile payments, what are, the, what are the key trends in mobile payments that you see, and particularly with regard to subscriptions? So, um, of course, everyone, I think, has uh, heard a lot about mobile payments in the last um, uh, few years. Um, there are some very important uh, uh, driving forces in this industry globally. Um, well, I, I would say well before the pandemics, um, there was a shift in, mobile, uh, well, in, in content consumption towards mobile and towards digital, um, which opened uh, a set of problems uh, for content providers for example, on how to process payments for large parts of the population. Um, we all have in mind the mature markets of the US, of Europe, uh, Singapore, and many other countries where credit cards are ubiquitous. Uh, but unfortunately, or, or fortunately, depends what you do, but um, it's not like this um, everywhere. Um, emerging markets, we know in this region, large markets like Indonesia or like India have a single digit uh, penetration of credit cards. Um, so obviously, uh, nobody could sell any um, uh, content in these markets if there weren't another uh, way to process payments. Uh, the other large segment that mobile payments cover in, 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 in aggregating uh, is, is the youth um, globally. So that would be also in, in mature economies, because um, if you think of uni students or first jobbers, uh, young adults, usually they don't have credit cards. So they need a way um, uh, to pay for mobile content. And, and here's where alternative payment methods in general um, come, come to help. And we, with this definition of alternative payment methods, usually we include both uh, uh, carrier billing and uh, e-wallets. How would you explain carrier billing for people who perhaps aren't quite yeah, familiar with it? I yeah, know, that's a good question. I know, you always get that question. <laughs> yeah. You have to ask. You know. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, we, we assume it's, it's known, but n not necessarily. I'm sure pretty much everyone is using carrier billing, but maybe most of you don't know. <clears throat> um, so carrier billing is that technology that um, allows you, as an end user, to buy uh, things with your mobile phone and to charge the expense to your phone bill, prepaid or postpaid. 
So that applies to apps that you buy on the main app stores, but it's also your um, video streaming subscription that gets charged to your, or comes free actually with your, included in your postpaid mobile bill. So all these um, uh, uh, ways that uh, you use to pay for content via your telco bill, it's in aggregate, we, it's called carrier billing or direct carrier billing or DCB also. And, and what, um, what do you see as some of the trends in carry billing that uh, you witness? So carry billing is, um, uh, is, is starting to become a sizable business. Um, we have some data from Omdia that tells us that uh, um, today it's a 58, let's say 60 billion US dollar uh, global business. It's going to 80 in the next three to four years, which is a, uh, a, a nice growth. But of course, what's, the, um, what's the, uh, the other important element that we have to consider? That if you look at this number and you put it in the context of the, uh, the revenues of the telecom industry as a whole, this makes less than 1%. Yeah. So th there are reasons why this is very important. We can perhaps elaborate on this later. But um, th you know, the telcos have to, to always consider that uh, it's, an important, um, it's an important technology, but it's not very well or very largely used yet. And for the telcos that are doing well, how are they actually leveraging that technology to deliver strong propositions? So in the last few years, um, we have seen a lot of um, uh, interesting partnerships between global brands uh, and, uh, and telcos, uh, and uh, also telcos themselves that have developed um, innovative services. Of course, this is also now um, monetizing or, let's say, capitalizing on the uh, advent of 5G that is giving new uh, reasons and new also bringing new capital to um, also think of how to package these new uh, mobile plans and these new actually offers that come with, with 5G. So um, there are, we, we can mention some of the, uh, of the work that has been done by, by telcos in Asia uh, with carrier billing. Um, for example, um, uh, launching innovative um, content. And again, thanks to 5G um, in Singapore, Singtel uh, is bundling um, content, for example, um, that is uh, AR uh, based. Like there's an app called Bookful that, uh, that is uh, an augmented reality based um, uh, app to actually enjoy books content. There's Melody VR, who's, uh, it's, it's the largest library of immersive um, content for live music streaming. Right. So these are all new forms of content that are coming thanks to 5G, and that uh, telcos can try and you know, put at the forefront and see if they can actually use them to leverage or more engagement with the end users. So how do you think they can play a more pivotal role in that ecosystem? What else could they be doing that they're not doing today? Um, so if we go back to what we were saying two minutes ago, 1% of telco revenues, yeah. right? That's, yeah. that's, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, it's the size. And this is not only a problem for the telco of getting internal priority to do projects about it, because it involves only 1% of revenue. But then if you calculate how much is that 1%, it also means that it may matter not much in absolute value, so 60 billion, to the entire content industry as a whole. So how can we make things better and leverage on this great technology to actually do something better? Um, one of our answers um, is scalability. So we have to make this uh, business more scalable. And uh, we can look at two dimensions. So one is, of course, time, and the other one is cost, uh, very typically. So time means time to market. Um, we know that nowadays, for a telco that has to embark in a new project yeah. that is transformational, um, it takes years yeah. if it ever gets approved. Um, uh, and on the other side, uh, of course, the, the, the flip side of this is that the cost for doing that usually uh, you know, start piling up, and in the end, projects really um, have negative MVPs. Uh, and, 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 you know, um, and in any case, even when they are completed, they never are like as per expectations. So one way successful telcos are trying to um, sort of win this trend is by using uh, software as a service, um, because this has uh, quite a few advantages in terms of time to market. So software as a service means that a telco can use a platform that is uh, usually cloud-based. Um, and therefore, in uh, maybe in a few weeks or 
in, in a few months they can be ready and live with the new service that they want to, um, uh, to, to launch instead of developing internally. And, um, you know, and therefore the time to market is, yeah. is, is, is much shorter. And at the same time, there's also a, a cost advantage because um, telcos don't need to maintain or manage a business among several legacy platforms, um, which is also expensive and it's not efficient. And, you know, it has a number of drawbacks as well. Um, so with, with the software as a service that is run in the cloud, obviously all these problems are, are, are not there. Yeah. But perhaps the most important feature is the global expertise that you gain when you uh, buy a platform. Because usually these platforms are run globally uh, for everyone in the industry, which means that uh, the features that they have uh, usually uh, leverage on the learnings that are made with the best uh, players or, let's say, the best practices in the industry. So the best features and the, the, you know, the new features are always made available to all the clients. And therefore, this is also a, a cost-effective way for telcos to stay on the leading edge uh, of the industry. One piece of, the, of data that we, we can share um, on this, so there's a research by Analysis Mason, that is a, yeah. an American firm, um, earlier this year, that um, actually shows that uh, the percentage of OPEX that telcos are dedicating to software as a service is actually more than doubling in three years. So it's going from 5% last year expected to be 11% next year, at the end of 2023. So that's quite an important growth that is also showing how telcos are actually pivoting uh, to this. And, and of course, I mean, this, this can't be the only element of a telco strategy that makes things more scalable, but clearly it helps a lot when your platform is assorted in, in, in a way. Barrier strategy are always a problem to, to kind of moving a project forward. So as, as, a, as consumers, if you look at it from the consumer's perspective, so you mentioned subscriptions. So what, what can I subscribe to? Which networks are live? With what type of subscriptions? Could you bring the proposition alive for us? So um, I think um, if uh, any of us have switched on a 5G uh, new plan recently, you probably have received tons of SMSs or uh, you know, or, or emails uh, from, from your telco provider with all the new offers that they're uh, giving you to make sure that you not only enjoy the faster speed of the network, but you also have other reasons to stay um, with them for as long as possible. So I think one of, one of the forms uh, that, uh, that we see like gaining more traction is what we call content bundling. Um, which means that uh, you have all the large names of uh, video streaming providers um, that actually uh, provide you with either a discounted or a free uh, service for a few months uh, if you stay in the telco plan. That is um, a very important way for OTTs, in this case video streaming providers, but there are also others. Uh, from gaming or from other verticals that, uh, that use this form. And so the, the value proposition for OTTs is to reach new users that they weren't tapping on before, and also to, um, let's say, to, 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 to keep the user engaged because at the same time uh, the user is locked in in a, usually a two years telco plan. So there is also that dimension to right. that. Okay. So uh, brand names, what, the Netflix of the world? What, yeah, what Netflix, are we talking about? Yeah, so Netflix. Um, so typically, uh, Netflix, is, Netflix is one of the champions of, um, okay. of this uh, bundling business. Uh, Amazon Prime uh, with not only actually Amazon with Prime, but also with all the other yeah. uh, digital content that they have. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a big um, growth now globally uh, uh, for in the segment of, of music again. So Amazon Music is um, actually growing pretty fast. Uh, audio books like, you know, with Audible and uh, okay. the other brands. So yeah. these are all trends on the rise. But if you look at it at in, in uh, like for, from a global perspective, the three categories that are the largest on bundling are definitely uh, video streaming. Uh, then there, are, there is the productivity um, segment where you have uh, both security and uh, like VPNs or antivirus and uh, uh, storage, yeah. like storage page, uh, cloud-based. And, uh, and the third one are social platforms. Okay. So these are the, 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 the three main. And just to give a, the, the flavor of how important this is, um, 
about two thirds of all new uh, 5G plans have some form of content bundle nowadays, which uh, this is an Omdia uh, figure. So this is important. So it comes back to the point we were making earlier. So it's only 1% of the business, but strategically it's very important for yeah. telcos. And that's why they, you know, in the years to come, we will see even more, um, say, pre positive pressure on, on this side to, to, to make new projects. Because fundamentally, um, what are the strategic advantages? One is this. So to basically, for a telco to retain um, an important uh, foot into the value chain of mobile content. And, um, and uh, the other one uh, is, uh, well, to, to monetize it, okay, uh, via, via payments. Yeah. So all those kind of strategic factors should drive more engagement, more interest, more consumer use. So if that's true, where could you imagine carry billing could be in five years' time? Well, if I have to go by Omnia's figure, <laughs> uh, it's going to, de to definitely surpass the uh, 80 to 100 billion uh, US dollars of uh, um, global revenues, which yeah. starts to be, uh, I would say, a, a large industry. Uh, we, could define, uh, we could define it that way. Um, yeah, it's, so, so therefore, more and more projects to come. But, uh, but again, it, those, uh, those 100 billions will not be equally split between all telcos. So there would be some telcos that would be in the leading edge of this and ripe the benefits, and others that, uh, I mean, as always uh, happens, that will, uh, will be laggards, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is all part of the race uh, for telcos to uh, go and, and chase the beyond core revenues. We know from, uh, from, from many researches that uh, nowadays the world average uh, is about 20 to 22 percent. Uh, I think this is a GSMA um, uh, number. Um, 22 percent on average is the portion of telco revenues that come from uh, non-core business. Yeah. But the thing is that the leading telcos are uh, above 40 percent, and the trailing telcos are in single digit. So it's, it's a chicken average that doesn't really tell the story. Yeah. Um, so, so a great opportunity, basically, is what, is what it, we it, see. It's an amazing opportunity, okay. yes. Listen, we need, we need to wrap up. I really appreciate you joining us today. Good luck with that. And I think you're, you and your team are around for the rest of today and tomorrow also, aren't you, if people Absolutely. like to catch you? Yes. So yes. thank you very much, Philippe. I really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Filippo. Thanks, Brian. Thank, thanks, thank thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Filippo. It's a super, re really interesting proposition, and the team are around if anyone would like to catch them over the next, uh, next day or so. So as I said, we're very busy, so I'd like to welcome on stage Trevor now for the first of three presentations we've got back to back to similarly explore this idea of new propositions and how they're powering mobile. Trevor? Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome back to Singapore, for those who haven't been here for a few years. It's a relief uh, in the air, so many people smiling. Laughing a little bit, renewing those connections that GSMA conferences are famous for. So um, enough of the Zoom, Meet, Skypes and WhatsApp for the next few days, I hope. I hope we can all just uh, enjoy our own presence here. Um, I lead the effort, uh, tying into here, I lead the effort for one of the uh, providers. Um, and we are quite a new company, obviously compared to a lot of the companies represented here. Uh, we're only a few years old and uh, we are called non-voice. Um, today I'll be sharing about what we've found about monetizing the 5G networks and the metaverse, as we always like to call, and offer a few fresh ideas tying into what we've just heard as well. Um, and yeah, obviously with our experience, we've also got a few f steps of how we've made it happen across a few telcos. Haven't used one of these for a while, it was quite fun. Press the button. Um, so we're really tying in. Was one of, we're one of the app agencies. So we work with many, many developers of apps across, well, we call it 4G, 5G, AR, VR in the future, uh, some even around edge computing. Uh, and uh, they're ideally suited for this new mobile digital age that we're all t here talking about. Our roots actually go back uh, 20 years, and I guess some of us here may not have been around 20 years ago, but uh, in the late 90s, our founder, Simon Buckingham, 
he wrote a book called Yes to SMS. And I'm not sure uh, how many people remember their first SMS they sent. Maybe it was WhatsApp for some people, but for me it was like 2001 and it was a wow. Uh, anyway, his book described uh, how to maximize the use of that very basic short message service. And obviously it contained uh, analysis of markets and uh, how, how and why and who the players were. Um, he then went on to set up a successful business uh, globally doing mobile content distribution and games. And uh, he finished up that business and listed it. And uh, it was certainly a pioneer tech company back in the uh, early 2000s. Across Asia, we were trying to sell Mr. Bean and a few uh, little uh, video clips back when there was WAP gateways. If anyone remembers WAP gateways, a few nods of the head. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's a bit of the history on the founder. Because yeah, I think it's significant because it's now 20 years later and we're in 4G legacy plus new 5G networks. We've also got this new thing called metaverse, which I think is still to be explained. I uh, don't want to be rude, but if I ask 20 people here what a metaverse is, I think I'd probably get about five or 10 different answers. Anyway, it really hasn't changed since we were back in those days. For most tel telcos and some of the service providers, innovation is usually the most strategic uh, agenda, yet the most, the most difficult to achieve and quantify. I think we've heard that from Docomo just there, just trying to understand where we are and how we do it and what works and what doesn't. And obviously there's sensitivities around where it is in the world. So our mission, as we all have now, is uh, we help change the ways that telco innovate for customers. I think that's core because they're paying the bills usually. And obviously within the ecosystem that we work across the developers and into the service providers, we end up uh, trying to make sure that everyone's on an equal understanding of what can happen and how they can monetize it. I'm getting used to that now. So yeah, as you've heard, and it ties in, uh, we're working right across a number of developers. I'll show you the segments in a couple of slides. But yeah, we gain a lot of intelligence about what's worked and what hasn't for their application in their market, or their early market, and then we usually uh, help them with uh, understanding where they could take them globally. So it's a bit of a consulting job. It's also a financing job. We're very lucky to be able to have access to the development community, and we have a bit of a small VC arm and access to the finance community, and we can come and help them to develop further as needed and or help with the scale up. The intelligence we bring from the app developers and the apps, we come into usually a common generic sharing model across some of the other carriers in terms of explaining to them what's worked and what hasn't. And that's putting us in a really good proposition for telcos to be able to go sit down and give them some ideas about deployment or about apps and about customization. And all the features that you heard you know, in the earlier conversation the new features across, say, across Europe, they may or may not work in Asia, but certainly it's a nice thing to be able to present to some of the mobile carriers um, to say, maybe you could start looking at some of this. So, as part of that, you've heard about a platform, so here's our platform play. We decided early on that it was pretty hard to deploy 10, 12 specific 5G apps to some of the telcos without doing an intermediary. The intermediary for us is a platform. We've called it the non-voice metaverse. I won't go into whether I like the size of it or not. But yeah, it certainly helps to accelerate the discussion for the adoption of getting a populace of apps onto a platform that can easily back into a telco's infrastructure and then being able to run pilots to see, what's happen see what happens across their consumer um, areas. The platform uh, really helps the pilots to get an understanding of certain marketplaces or certain segments. Maybe it's a youth market, maybe it's a sports market, and then 
to see where their development might go further for the bigger markets that we've got them into. So yeah, so at the moment we're more around, uh, um, I guess, apps, but NFTs are the next thing, which I'll lead you to. Um, we're also lucky enough to be an intermediary across some of the hardware. So we've mentioned here at the bottom AR glasses, which seem a bit old-fashioned now that VR one's in, but it's trying to commercialise those to some of the markets where um, uh, the cost is uh, prohibitive. So here's our simple platform play. Uh, subscribe, uh, browser catalogue, uh, download from your Play Store, so it's going external, and then with a special authentication code with the development community, we've been able to formulate full functionality or specific functionality, and then really coming back to the telco um, at the same time if they want to further that. We understand telcos need that their networks uh, you know, pre prefer to have high, high bandwidth requirements. And as we heard, that's the, maybe the, uh, the bandwidth required with video or music or something like that. Um, and yeah, that's why some of the apps are more, um, more, uh, well, well, more well represented on some of the, uh, some of the uh, solutions that we've had because of the bandwidth requirements. So yeah, quite a simple thing bolts into uh, to all, all sorts of areas of telco in a secure, scalable environment. Apps, you talk apps. Well, I, I can't even mention the ones that we are talking to, but there's some pretty cool stuff. I think you've, uh, you can get an idea that if we're talking across the globe, as we are across the development communities here in Asia, Europe, US, South America, um, yeah, we have a pretty interesting catalogue, so come and see us if you want some samples of that. Um, really, it's around uh, AR games. I th find the, they're some of the big interesting ones, especially for the last two years where we've been at home, working from home, and obviously not playing games. All the kids were not at school and doing their homework at home and not playing games. Uh, Sports, of course, that's always a big one for some of the more mature audiences and some of the younger ones if they get the bandwidth requirement. Obviously, for telcos, it's a match between broadband and, of course, other networks. So, yeah, you've got to interplay that into the discussions. Some of the other ones are obviously a bit more uh, a bit with the business side or the, the other side for Asia families, they'll know, education. And uh, we have a suite of uh, education, like the ones mentioned, Bookful, um, where we can come in and have something that's, uh, I guess, quite innovative across the education sector. Uh, and with uh, virtual customization, it's quite effective in terms of that education we've found with uh, being more immersive. The other side, which we hope will grow with some of the bigger telcos, I think is more the enterprise suite. And we've started with about 12 apps that sort of create a mi mini suite of, of interesting uh, apps, and yeah, I think that goes a lot further in the future, because I think as we all know, enterprise have a checkbook, and uh, they are certainly uh, looking at this 5G and advanced networks a lot more seriously now that there's a lot more work from home. <coughs> Quick pitch, NFTs. We've just built another platform for our NFTs, it allows distribution, purchase, and sale uh, of NFTs of various types, as you can see there. Uh, some are more recognizable, like digital art. Some are more rewards coupons. And um, then, obviously, the platform delivers those and manages those for the people. In the new mobile economy, I guess that's the title, yeah, we're pretty proud to be helping uh, people from all sides of the ecosystem, whether it's the operators, whether it's the uh, new uh, virtual operators, some of the other providers. We're happy uh, to work with them, with the development community, to be a, a real sharing mechanism within the ecosystem. And uh, I think we've gained a lot of traction just being able to open up conversations um, to work at helping to get uh, everyone on a common language and to understand what's going on. 
Um, in general, I think we offer pretty innovative uh, ideas and a couple of good scalable platforms that can easily uh, get those pilots going, which seemed to be quite of the essence of the earlier conversation, is getting telcos to at least get their consumers to start trialing some stuff. The other side of it is, um, you know, uh, with real connections like at GSMA, really uh, being able to provide them in the last couple of years has been amazing. Um, anyway, thank you very much for getting me on the floor, wishing you a happy networking session uh, with open minds, lack of masks, and a glass of bubbles in your hand. Thank you. Thanks very much, Trevor. We really appreciate it. And um, good luck. And to continue the theme uh, of, of innovation, I'd like to welcome Rajesh onto the stage to talk us about a DeFi proposition. Rajesh. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm here to represent Telcoin. So uh, before that, thank you for having us here. Special thanks to our organizers, uh, GSMA, and the uh, sponsors, Docomo Digital. Uh, before I elaborate more on who we are in, in our core suite of solutions, probably I'd like to kick off with our mission statement. Uh, today, we are all cognizant of the uh, plethora of challenges that the blockchain industry, or to be very specific, the Web 3.0 is facing. Uh, for the right reasons, there's been a paradigm shift from uh, digital asset monetization to actual value generation. And if you look at our uh, motto right from our foray into this industry, it has been how to harness and unlock uh, the disruptive power of blockchain and uh, fintech technology to drive financial inclusion. Uh, we've always believed that the telecoms or the mobile networks with the uh, mobile outreach, uh, the connectivity and trusted uh, regulated stack of solutions are a natural ally for us which is why we've been uh, uh, very lucky to have a lot of uh, m and partners early in our journey and also honored to be the first digital asset associate member of GSMA. Here's a quick overview of who we are. Uh, we are a global startup, fast growing, uh, offices spanning across multiple locations. Wouldn't uh, bore you with the details, but in terms of uh, highlighting the salient aspects of our business model, we are a compliance by design company, which essentially means that we operate and offer our financial services only with the appropriate licensing offered by the central bank in each jurisdiction. We also work only with the compliant partners, whether they are the local mobile wallets or those who provide the rails and connectivity for us in each market. We work with those trusted partners. Uh, in terms of our unique differentiation, we were instrumental for the uh, first crypto charter in the state of Nebraska and are also poised to be, by end of this year, uh, the first company to have the Fed-regulated digital asset bank that will enable us to issue stable coins globally. These are fiat peg stable coins, uh, not prone to the price volatility as we have seen with some of the other digital assets. So we built a modular stack of solutions, keeping in mind specifically how we can drive incremental value to our telecom partners. It was easy for us to begin the journey with fiat remittance. That's what is available in the market. Uh, there are multiple mobile wallets globally. Uh, and our job is how we can source pump traffic into these mobile wallets. And the telecoms can leverage on our licensing in the different source markets. Uh, we truly believe the future of the next generation cross-border transfers are going to happen on blockchain through stable coins which is where we have already uh, uh, started various pilot programs and started working specifically in US corridor. And there's a lot of optimization when it comes to uh, emerging markets. Uh, the global World Bank data states that uh, the average remittance fees, a lot of that coming from Forex markup, and the uh, fees that the intermediaries charge is 6.3%. If you look at the emerging markets here on the other side, which is close to 9, 10%, so there's a lot of room for optimization which comes in the form of stablecoin settlement. And there are more advanced models which are also experimenting where certain telecoms who want to pivot into the next level blockchain powered wallet solutions, we have a white label or a distribution mechanism similar to my friends who spoke about it earlier. Uh, this is just again uh, a right place to highlight what the GSMA data states that uh, despite all the mobile digital first em emphasis, there's a lot of untapped potential to move from the traditional 
uh, uh, physical fiat-based transactions into the mobile world. The mobile wallets are only capturing 3%, uh, similar to some of the data earlier shared in terms of carrier billing or digitization. There's a lot of scope for mobile wallets to also tap into this digital transaction. And, and how we can help as Telcoin is obviously coming up with the regulated remittance services and totally mask the underlying complexities because there are different form factors possible when it comes to deposits and withdrawals, mobile money, fiat, different stable coins, so we can totally uh, mask all those intricacies and provide a seamless layer when telcos partner with us. I think the next slide uh, is, is just to again say when we start with the fiat remittances, we already connected, so this is not just about a white paper or pilot solution to more than dozens of uh, telcos, MNOs, in Philippines, Malaysia, Africa, South Asia, both directly and through aggregators who rely on our licenses in US, Canada, and, and these source markets, and we pump traffic into these mobile wallets, uh, boosting their remittance volume and also providing new incremental source of revenue. Uh, sorry, uh, the next one is just a quick, uh, it's better to see the user journey and visualize uh, with with this uh, video, so I'll just run this. Sending and receiving a fiat remittance to mobile money using the Telcoin application. Launch the Telcoin app and tap send. Enter the recipient's details and input the amount to send. Check the details, enter your PIN and confirm the transaction. The beneficiary will receive a notification, which they can tap for options. Then, they simply select their mobile money account and tap Accept. It's that easy. So I just want to emphasize in the previous video that the, the fee structure, if you see, is fully transparent. The user gets to know exactly what's, what's it that they provide. We aspire to be the cheapest. There are a whole gamut of players operating fintechs, especially in the fiat space. It's getting very crowded. And we push the fees to as low as possible. The floor is typically around 1% or max 2%. But where can the next uh, level of optimization come from? It's basically through these stable coins. And you may ask why, what's the reason for innovation? What's the pressing problem we are solving? I think uh, there are at least a couple of major ones in terms of bringing the fees further down. Uh, if you're talking about BIPs, 30, 40, 50 BIPs or pennies for each transaction, that's what it should cost on a blockchain layer. Uh, stable coins will allow you to do that because we're, you're eliminating all these intermediaries who will have to do the different ramps in each market. And that's what a blockchain-based transaction allows you to do. The second is about the transparent and instant settlement. And again, World Bank data, average settlement time in emerging markets is about five days. You do it on blockchain, it's immediately validated. The customer, what you would see is that uh, in the same transaction when it goes from the uh, sender to the beneficiary is settled instantly and approved uh, for a fraction of the fees. So we hear again the same user journey, but uh, Liam sends instead of a $200, a 200 USD stable coin, which is the one-to-one -one fiat peg. And here the fees has come down to less than a percent. It's about 0.5 percent. Instantly settle and, and the beneficiary receives. And now the beneficiary can either hold it in stable coin, can swap for a different digital asset, participate in the digital economy, use it for payments uh, from various retailers. There is a, a authentic research which demonstrates that about 75% of retailers in future will accept some form of crypto uh, payment. So this again provides an avenue for the beneficiaries to make payment transactions as well. And, and lastly, so if there are MNOs who want to embark, uh, the, the telecom carriers who want to embark on this opportunity, so we do provide a white label option for them where they're able to distribute, refer, and offer this wallet solution. It's equally applicable to a really well-established telco like a Globe who have their Gcash marquee product in the market, or to an MNO who don't have any existing wallet. You want to come up with a compliant, regulated, and provide the economical uh, solution for their subscribers 
to transact on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's international transfers, trade, or payments, then that's what precisely our solution will enable us to do. And in return, the MNOs would grab an incremental revenue share by participating, working with us with no initial outlay or investment. Uh, and, and, and once again, the proof point is we have launched this app in the US, and ours is more a decentralized exchange where users hold the key, they, they own custody, so funds can't be moved unilaterally. Uh, and then we have seen record growth in terms of transaction and average revenue per user, uh, analogous to the ARPU in the telco world, able to generate up to 40 to 50 in a developed market. But even if you consider emerging markets where not too many digital assets are available, we still believe that we would be able to significantly inc increase the existing ARPU. So, uh, and this brings to the other use case. Uh, uh, in terms of, we've seen so far the application layer, again, equivalent to the OTT that currently runs on, uh, uh, on the current uh, telecom infrastructure. Uh, we saw alluding to all the senior visionary telco leaders speaking earlier today morning where they were talking about how telecom should pivot from being a telco to a techco and about these digital uh, platform acceleration that need to happen on 5G. We thought about this uh, problem the same way when it comes to blockchain. Today, who's validating, who's mining the transactions? It's basically on a public layer. It's a trustless public layer, which is great because it's, it, it opens up to everybody, but it also uh, uh, lets other problems seep in, which comes in the form of security or very high transaction or gas fees. So what we have done is built an exclusive validation layer meant only for GSMA associate telco members, about 750 plus of them, as you would know globally, were able to validate, process these transactions. So not only they're able to control the app layer and the, and the services that write, but also be able to monitor, capture a pie of the blockchain validation and the transaction settlement layer. Uh, and, and again, we, are, uh, we started its exploratory discussion. This is still in infancy. We started uh, working with some of them who have shown interest about the pilots. Uh, there are some already proof points, like Tasha Telecom is already experimenting with their own settlement layer with another uh, tech provider as well. Uh, that brings an end to the presentation. We are over here. My colleagues are with us as well. So thank you for your time again and the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rajesh. And a super presentation and a, a really innovative solution. And good luck to all the team. I think the guys are around for a couple of days if anybody would like to catch them. Uh, so I'd now like to introduce the, the final presentation before we do a couple more fireside chats. I'd like to introduce Dan Haran from Dynasty Gaming to give us some insights on it, gaming in APAC. Dan. Thanks, Brian. OK, it's been a long hour and a half. Do you want to put your hands up and down or jump up and down or get some energy back into the room? <laughs> okay, so my name's Dan. I'm, uh, I'm from Dynasty. Uh, I, I used to sit on that side of the fence. I was in telco for probably 15, 20 years as a CMO, CCO, that sort of thing. So very familiar with these sessions and, and very familiar with your problems. And as a company, what we do is we focus on gaming and media and in particular to help telcos as a business enter that space, grow it, monetize it, engage with your customers, and hopefully bring some success to, to all parties. So I'm going to share with you some, uh, some examples and details on what, what, we're, uh, what we're about, a little bit about the market, and, uh, and what the future holds for gaming and media. So a couple of big numbers. Um, gaming itself is now uh, about 180 billion US dollars uh, globally. So put, putting that into context, it's bigger than Hollywood and music streaming, movies, the whole lot all put together. I think everybody probably knows that. But uh, importantly, it's not the niche thing that you used to think about. You know, gamers are not these people that sit in a, a dark room drinking energy drinks, eating Mars bars or something like that. This is mainstream now. This is not what it used to be. You guys have helped facilitate that. You've built 4G networks, 5G networks, fiber optic networks. You've launched 5G phones, 4G phones, fantastic tablets. That's helped facilitate gaming go from this PC orientated environment where someone would play something called Dota into I'm sitting in a car, I'm, I'm walking, I'm anywhere in, in, in any part of the world playing a game. 
this is really important. You look at the, the population, uh, you know, Asia makes up, Asia Pacific makes up half the gamers in the world. So really key for, for your markets here, particularly given that we're in Singapore here now today. So this is super exciting stuff. I won't dwell on those numbers. You can, you can all probably research them. Why is it important for a telco? That's the most important question that you guys have to ask. There's basically a couple of very, very simple answers to that question. Number one, the number of people playing games on your network. Depending on which country you're in, it's, it's going to be at least half your network. There's 1.6 billion people globally playing games every day. So somebody in your country right now is playing games on the network. Number two, really key, 50% of your customers playing games, uh, sorry, 50, start again. <laughs> We all make mistakes. <laughs> Gamers represent 50% of your telco high value customers. So if you think about the high value customers on your network, half of them are playing games. That's very, very important. Why is it important? Number one, if you lose them to a competitor, you've just lost a high value customer. If you gain them from a competitor, wow, you've just really increased your revenue. Number two, how do you keep them? You want to keep your customers happy. Gamers are really hard to talk to. <laughs> They're very hard to talk to. They're no longer moving on social networks. If you look at the in, uh, in the US, places like that, they're no longer using things like Facebook. They're moving away from the traditional channels. And they're playing games. How do you talk to a customer like that? So a high value customer that's playing games, very important to your network. The third thing is, overall, out, as an outcome of that, these guys are contributing 50 to 70% of your revenue. So these people are super important to you, disproportionately. Now, uh, screen time, also very important. 30% of the screen time of gamers is going, uh, sorry, 30% of the screen time now uh, that you have in your network is going on gamers. Now, whether it's them playing the game itself or watching something on the network, you know, I, how many of you got kids? I've got a little girl, she's six. <laughs> she loves Minecraft, she loves Roblox. They sit there and watch it. I, I don't understand why personally, but, <laughs> but they're watching it. So screen time that these people are consuming on your network is huge. And, uh, and this is really, again, another important reason why this is critical for you as a telco. How many of you as a telco know how much revenue gaming is contributing to you? as a company? Pretty important question. If we don't have the answer to that, considering that half of your population on the network are playing games, watching videos, doing things, participating, purchasing, and we have no idea. Very, very important. So when we look at gamers, what's important to them? Again, it's quite simple. There are three core things that they love. Number one, they love value. If you talk to a gamer, they want to buy in-game credits. They want to buy crystals, gems, you name it, whatever it is, those sorts of things. So being able to give them a great deal is very, very important to them. Rewards, tournaments, uh, prize pools, all of that sort of stuff. They love to win. Gamers love to win. Everyone loves something for free. So value to the gamer is critical. Second thing, community. They love to talk to each other. They love to participate. They love to show. They love to learn. So when you think about things like user-generated content, social networks, all of these sorts of things, leaderboards, everyone wants to see themselves on a leaderboard, number one. Which trophy did you get? All of these sorts of things. Um, and then finally, engagement. This is the piece where they want to compete. I want to play somebody else. I want to compete in a tournament. Um, I want to broadcast myself or I want to watch a broadcast or a stream. These sorts of things are critical for gamers. Now, again, as a telco, most of these things you will have no idea about because you've never really uh, engaged in the gaming space. Uh, and that's when you look at what's important to a gamer, these aspects here. So if you want to attract, retain, and grow a gamer on your base, these are really important things to know about. So from a dynasty perspective, what we do is very simple. We understand that gaming is not native to a telco. Um, so what we do is we provide a white-labeled platform. 
and we allow then or in, uh, empower the telco to enter the gaming environment. So when you look at the sorts of things that you have here, uh, these are different functional elements that we provide modularly to a telco in a platform, as I said, as a white labeled service. So that allows you to provide under your own brand, or not, and I'll come back to that in a second, a gaming service directly to the customer. Now, in some of the markets that we participate in, it's a branded product under the, the telco name. In others, it's not. And the reason for that is that they provide it as a, a, a standalone service to actually attract non-telco customers from their own environment so that they can then go back and market to them. So it's a total market play. Now we provide that platform to them and then from there we also provide not just the platform itself but we provide a service. We help arrange tournaments. We help with the publisher agreements. We help with all of the things that a telco is not natively used to. And we take away all of that heavy lifting and we provide the service to them as a turnkey. So as a telco, what's important to you is that, you, number one, you want to market a product to, directly to your customers. So we integrate into your CRM systems. We integrate into your billing platforms. I was super happy to see uh, the Docomo presentation earlier. Direct carrier billing, all of those sorts of things, we integrate into all of that. So as a telco, you have something which you can market directly to all of your customers. You have something that allows or enables the, the, the purchasing and payments side of things. And then you have a brand that you can obviously build within the market that allows you to engage and, and uh, promote. So from a commercial perspective, how does this make sense again to a telco? There's many, many different ways. Number one, the ability to charge for, for the in-game credits and those sorts of things, you, you make a commission on those. Advertising revenues, sponsorship revenues, wagering and prize pools. There's about a dozen different uh, monetization aspects in this platform that allows you to make money and enter the ecosystem of gaming and not only just become a platform that engages with the, with the customer, but someone that also monetizes on a B2C basis and on B2B basis as well. So these are the sorts of things that we provide as a service. And when you start to think about the gaming trends moving forward, um, this is also very exciting. So what we talked about earlier around you know, sort of game credits and those sorts of things, they're very much web 2.0 type environment. I, mean, I guarantee every telco's got a VAS department or something like that in it. Um, but as we move forward, that's going to dramatically change. So purchasing the virtualized goods like crystals or gems and those sorts of things is on the far left, as you sort of see there. But as you start to move forward, everybody's heard of eSports and the prize pools and all of those sorts of things. This is, this is already happening right now. We can now start to move into that space and help facilitate telcos to run and manage eSports environments and those sorts of things. Moving a little bit further forward, the content, so broadcasting and streaming and those sorts of things. Again, reverting back to what we put on the platform. Moving further again, Engaging with KOLs and influencers and those sorts of things. Many telcos already have lots of influencers and, and uh, key influencers on their networks and partnerships. Again, gamers are not just people that think about games. If I think about musicians, they play games. If I think about sports stars, they play games. And we then facilitate the ability to leverage their influence and networks, bringing gaming to life with them, with your network as well. And then finally, as we start to move into uh, NFTs, uh, I think you were mentioning NFTs earlier, um, we have an NFT marketplace. As a telco, you have so many assets that you can, uh, you can populate and mint as an NFT. Gaming is probably one of the most real aspects around NFTs and how to make money. I mean, we've seen uh, a lot around art, but my view is that very clearly gaming has this aspect to it. Everybody wants to get a special skin. Everybody wants to get something in-game, a weapon or this or that. So it, it lends itself perfectly to NFTs. So we have a solution that allows us to, to mint and trade on uh, closed markets and open markets uh, uh, NFTs moving forward. So uh, as you can start to see then from a preference perspective, the game is moving from uh, environment to environment. So then uh, let me think, just sort of move to the publisher space just very quickly. So I, I'm sure you've all heard of something like Epic or Fortnite. 
you know, those sorts of games, EA, uh, FIFA. So we work very closely with the publishers as well. The publishers love telcos, believe it or not. <laughs> they love them. And the reason is that you can br bring so much benefit to the, the game publishers if you've got the right environment to support them. So as a game publisher, I want to reduce my spend to acquire customers. So if I can promote a game directly to customers, I've just reduced my, my marketing spend. What can a telco do? <laughs> Market directly to a base, depending on the country you've got, 10, 20, 30 million customers. Second thing, the user uplift. You can do all sorts of re um, repeat CRM activities directly to the users that allows them to, to consistently engage with the game. Third thing, paying and revenue, DCB, number one. We talked about that earlier. The other thing is that from a billing platform perspective, we can also start to package things up. So I heard some things earlier around packaging up to, uh, sort of plans where you can have a, a prepaid or postpaid plan where you put gaming things into it. We can do all of that sort of stuff with our platform. So it gives you the ability then from a publisher's perspective to start to put some really interesting things together in local markets. The third thing is the game long longevity. So publishers want to make sure that the customer is playing their game for a long time. As a telco, you have the ability to help support all of that sort of thing and increase the life cycle of that customer on the game. Because every minute they're on the game, they're probably buying something or consuming something. So as a telco, you can facilitate these sorts of things. So, so what we do as a company is we not only bring the platform and help support, run and manage it, but we have global partnerships with all those sorts of companies where we can bring together amazing experiences and, and launch them in the market. We've also begun publishing games. And as a, as a, uh, a telco, uh, this becomes super key. If you imagine a value chain, if you're at the far right-hand side as a telco today, you basically do DCB and you might get 4 or 5% on a, a Google Play or a, a, an Apple Store sale. Probably, something like that. If you publish a game, you move from 4 or 5% all the way back to 70%. Right? A lot more value. Now, you can publish traditional games, but what we're seeing as a trend is play to earn becomes critically important. So what we've been doing is we've been, uh, uh, we're now in the publishing side for, for play to earn. Play to earn in the next five years will be about $80 billion, eight zero. It'll be huge. For some markets, the Philippines, Indonesia, it's already big. Um, and it's consistently getting better. But play to earn is basically based on blockchain and crypto. Um, so it's a very simple sort of logic. Customers will go into the game. They will play the game, participate, battle it out, all sorts of different things and they will hopefully earn real cash, real money for it. Depending on the market, there's regulatory frameworks that allow you to participate in the crypto side of things, and some not. Uh, de again, depending on the telcos, some are sort of more engaged in that environment, some aren't. We provide both solutions, so we can provide an, uh, access into the, the, the full crypto environment, or we can also provide, from a loyalty and reward sort of side of things, a points-based system that allows you to still get the benefits of a play-to-earn game, but uh, have it based around your own loyalty and rewards points. I know, Brian, you're going to wind me up in a second. I'll, I'll skip through a few very, very quickly. We, what we also look at is uh, a player's passion. So uh, think about sports, academies, those sorts of things. Gaming is very similar in logic to physical. So uh, if you think about football, rugby, those sorts of things, um, you know, have academies and growth, all of that sort of thing for people from grassroots all the way through. So we provide uh, also what we call a, a gaming and AI academy. Our sister company in, uh, in the UK is called Guild. Uh, Guild is a Beckham uh, a partnership company. And they basically build and create teams that provide these sorts of things in local markets as well. So we, we provide a full suite of services around that sort of stuff. And then finally, uh, this is uh, I think the second to last, or last slide, sorry, yeah, last slide. Um, we've, we've now moved into the whole metaverse side of things. Uh, another sister company of ours is called Block Trust, uh, and effectively what we create is a uh, NFT marketplace which we embed into the solution with the telco. So it allows you then to not only have a gaming and media platform, but you also have a NFT marketplace that allows you to mint 
and uh, 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 sell from a, a primary market perspective all the way into secondary markets and beyond for, for NFT type products. So we, we provide all of those sorts of things in the platform. Now as a telco, obviously that's a huge amount of things to think about and it, it can be quite complex when you, when you think about all of that sort of coming together. So it's all modular. And typically what we do is we start with a very basic service with the, with the telco, launch with things like competitive esports, the stores and content, and then progressively add modules over a period of time to, to uh, build this out. So, uh, so that uh, hopefully gives you some insights around uh, uh, where we're going and what we're doing uh, from a dynasty perspective. But, uh, but conceptually, what we're here to do is really help telcos uh, accelerate into the gaming environment and take advantage of the current legacy Web 2 environment, but set themselves up so that they don't lose out in Web 3, in particular with one of the biggest uh, uh, gaming industries uh, on, on the planet. So thank you all. And thank Super. you, Brian. Great presentation. Thanks, Dan. Re uh, super solution, really grounded in some uh, amazing insight, really, just really compelling numbers uh, have not seen before. So uh, really, really interesting. And big thanks to all our, our, all our three guests for, for presenting today. So now we're going to do another fireside chat. And um, it wasn't deliberate, the segue between all these that flow, but Dan mentioned crypto. So at this point, I'd like to welcome Abby besides the head of product for crypto.com uh, based in Singapore. Abby, thanks for joining us. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. I, I know um, it was great to, for you to join us on lots of things to kind of chat through today. Um, but when I was lo looking a bit in your, your background and kind of the brands you've worked for, I was really intrigued because you were at Google. And to make that move to crypto, what, what did you see in crypto that felt it was time to move on from one of the largest tech brands in the world? Uh, that's a great question. I, I do get that question a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think, um, you know, it, this is, it's, it's a personal view. Um, at, uh, at, at Google, I mean, they, the one thing that Google ingrains into you as when you're building products is how do you make an impact on the life of a user, right? Yeah. What, how are you obsessing about what, what your end user is looking for and how are you making sure it, it impacts them? And um, I, I think, you know, we, I had a chance to work on some fantastic products at Google doing that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, in, in addition to that, when you think about uh, crypto, and you think about Web3, and you think about the, the, the promise of this new technology from the perspective of the potential to make an impact. Yeah. It's tremendous. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that's a huge attraction. Uh, and you know, that uh, combined with uh, the leadership team we have at Crypto.com, they're, they're trying to they have a really strong vision. They're trying to build something lasting. Um, that, that's probably what sold me into doing this. <laughs> it's fantastic. I, I, I saw some ads recently. Uh, which celebrates the fact Crypto.com was six years old, which I've got to say, that was, that was a surprise to me. So w what's that journey been like? What's, yeah. what's, been, what's been going on during that six-year period? That's right. It's been time flown by six years, uh, um, yeah. and we've been around for six, uh, six years now. And in, in that time, you know, what our focus has been is we've essentially, over time, constructed a, a digital Web3 ecosystem, right? right? We've, um, we cover products that cover payments, we look at trading, uh, we look at financial services, but everything from a Web3, everything from a blockchain angle. Um, in that time, we've seen the, the industry evolve a lot too, and, and, and to service that as part of our ecosystem, we have expanded our product set yep. um, uh, quite a bit as well. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of been our focus on, on how do we you know, look back at the last, uh, last six years and how do we plan ahead to the, the future as well. Thank you. And I'm interested because of your role, clearly, you're, you're going to be continually doing scans of the business environment. So, but because of the breadth of your proposition, I'm really in, intrigued to know how do you define your business environments and, and therefore what are the key trends that you see? Um, yeah, um, look, I think the, the biggest trend you have to think about is, um, I mean, in the current environment, we often talk about the crypto markets going up and down. Yeah. But, but if you really take a macro view of this, um, in the last not that long period, maybe a year, year, a year, year and a half, we've gone from an industry which 100 million people were engaging in to 300 million people, right? That's a tremendous growth in this industry. Um, you know, during that time, you know, we have tried to build products that service this, this group of people, and you know, we're proud of the fact that a lot of them use our products. Yes. Um, and the, I, I see that, if you look at the market scan, I, I see that trend continuing. I, I see that over time, 
more and more people will engage with crypto. Um, you know, a, a while back, the question was really more about crypto was meant for people who were really keen on it. And they wanted to kind of jump through a bunch of hurdles to be able to access the, the products or the features or the opportunities. And that's starting to shift, starting to shift to people who are more curious about it and want to be able to engage with it in a way that, uh, you know, that uh, it's educational, that's introductory uh, into that space. And, and so I, I see that trend continue. I mean, there's tons of forward-looking research out there that says that this market should continue to grow, not just at 300 million, but it should like grow multiple fold from that. Yeah. And, and, you know, my job is to make sure we build the right products for those people who are coming into this industry for the first time. So do, do you feel that we're past that for early adopter phase then with, with crypto? Are we, are, we, are we past that? Or? Well, it's a, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, no, I, in, in some ways, you know, it, um, what, you have, what you are seeing is that you're starting to see some mainstream discussion about crypto, right? Yeah. You're, you're starting to see people, you know, whether it's government organizations or there's large banks, you know, kind of this conversation is shifting more towards embracing the technology, right. um, codifying the regulation around that technology, um, looking at how does it help drive innovation in different use cases. So um, from that perspective, yes, we are beyond the, the existential question that always got asked about it. Uh, but at the same time, the use cases are very nascent, right? Like there's a, there's a very, very heavy emphasis on investment-related discussions that happen in the space of crypto at the moment. Um, and, and I think over time, what we will see and we would like to see is that evolve uh, into much more, much more interesting use cases around commerce, for example. Yes, yeah. Filippo was talking in the first session about, um, I think for, for those of us who worked for, for telcos, the challenge of um, new product development in a large corporate is really, it's really difficult because there's so many things to do. So I'm really in, always interested to know how product heads how, what the process they use to kind of create ideas and get them through the business. Could you share a little bit of insight uh, sure. to what crypto does? You know, in, in, in some ways, this, this can go both ways, but we're very fortunate to be in crypto industry. Our, our, our users don't wait for us to ask them um, for feedback. <laughs> There's constant feedback streams. Okay. Um, and, and, but we make sure we look at them. Uh, so uh, as we are developing our products, um, we are very aware of the fact that it's a growing industry. So it's technologies, use cases are still emerging. Right? Many things we talked about and some of the other speakers talked about, they're just so nascent uh, that the real purpose, the real potential is still being discovered. Um, so we can't always look at a benchmark or we can't always look at a specific user problem and say, I want to be like that one, solve that one. Yeah. Right? We have to constantly iterate. Um, and, and to enable that, you know, a, a big focus of my job, for example, is to make sure we are set up to be able to try new things really quickly. Right uh, and, and and learn from them. Right, we we want to be able to make decisions quickly. We want to be able to uh, try things out. We want to be able to collect user feedback. We want to be able to constantly have our pulse on the ground in terms of what our users are talking about, uh, and 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 adapt to that. And and you will see that's how we have you know we've looked at this from an ecosystem perspective. Right, our role in this ecosystem is not only are we a a brand and a and a player in the ecosystem, yeah. we have a role to to grow the entire space, uh, yeah. and and we want to we want to help, you know, developers come in and, and build into this ecosystem. We want to help yeah, new users come in and learn about it. Uh, we want to partner with, uh, you know, what we would call traditional, I, I guess, Web two world of you know the banks and government regulators, and and, and we want to we want to work with them to try and grow that ecosystem. That 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 is the focus we try and bring to this. Okay, and and just so on your new product development process then. Do you, do you do is there lots of pilots going on, or is there lots of customer research going on, and how do you get the feedback back in? Is it kind of do people just put stuff on Twitter and you literally read it and start to consider it? Is that how it works? Um, not always, but yes, we read Twitter. Uh, there's a lot of social channels um, that, that, absolutely, jokes aside, we keep a very yeah. strong pulse on. Yeah. Um, we have a very strong user research team uh, that does uh, does their own research as well, and we use that. Um, we look at um, the industry trends. We look at where we want to be. Um, we look at what's our place in some new emerging use cases. Right. Um, you know, when you talk about, um, I'll give you an example. Like when, uh, when NFTs very early on in their life cycle, we, we launched an NFT platform about a year ago. Right. right? Uh, and, and we really launched it as a, you know, uh, as a proof point of starting to see if users would engage. And it grew a lot. 
to uh, to a stage where it's a it's a core product offering for us at the moment, right? And and we're opening it up to any creator to come in okay. and list their collection onto NFTs. Um, now, you know, so from one side, I would say yes, it's a core product for us still evolving. But if you look at the NFT space. You know, I would argue that the uh, NFTs are still evolving in their purpose. Um, yes. And, and, and so that will happen over time. Uh, and, and we want to be able to kind of not just say we launched the platform. We want to be able to kind of look at where does that area going, right? Um, yeah. and, and one thing that you will find is that with NFTs, the, you can react and say we built a marketplace. But actually what NFTs really offer is... NFTs have a very strong sense of community building, right? right? Uh, communities are coming together, Discord groups are coming together where you have to verify with an NFT to get in. Um, and, and that's a really interesting trend to think about, right? How is, uh, you know, how is not just the world of crypto or the world of NFTs, but how is this technology facilitating that community building that's happening in the Web3 space? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, as, as looking at it purely from a product perspective, we have to think ahead yes. to how would we facilitate that transition or that, uh, uh, or that convergence of, you know, what we might think as a transaction of a purchase or a sale of an NFT to that community building aspect that the user is looking for. So you mentioned NFT, so that sounds like that's an important part of your future plans. I also saw crypto.com pay, which which really made me smile, just it was a very, very clever thing. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it, it is. I'm really excited about the, our payment product. Uh, you know, we have a series of things we're trying to do in the payment space. Um, right. We have a crypto.com Visa card, um, yeah. uh, which you can top up with crypto. Yeah. Uh, you can earn rewards in crypto um, on that card. And it can be used anywhere that um, a Visa card is accepted. Uh, and you know, by itself, that product is, is probably one of the largest programs uh, of its kind. Um, but at the same time, what we're also trying to evolve towards is we, we are enabling merchants to accept any of 250 different cryptocurrencies, right? right. Um, and we're starting to kind of move towards that offering more and more of those options to merchants. So our users can choose, for example, today from a long list of cryptocurrencies they can use to pay or to do an online checkout. Right, so we have a full online checkout product on CryptoPay. Um, merchants can enable this product. Uh, users can pay them straight on crypto, and there are zero transaction fees um, of doing this. Okay. Um, and, and we're seeing that adoption starting to grow. Okay. Uh, we're starting to see merchants ask about this more. Right. Um, you know, we're starting to, uh, you know, merchants are coming in saying, well, they're hearing from the users that they want to be able to pay with crypto. And, and as a result, they are in, they're interested to learn more about how to accept crypto. Um, it, just uh, recently, earlier this year, we launched a partnership with Shopify. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and the goal of that partnership is, is that, to, to bring all of the merchants that are on Shopify, Shopify's platform to easily enable crypto payments. Right? Um, and the, what I'm really excited about it is that this, this product actually um, really solves a bunch of problems that exist in the payment space today. Right. Right? Um, it's, uh, like I said, zero transaction fees. Yeah. Um, it is directly users paying in crypto to merchants having a choice in whether they want to accept crypto or they want to convert that immediately to US dollars and keep that. Um, and it's enabling a whole new set of users to come into these merchants. Right. Um, so some interesting use cases developing in yeah. that payment space. So, on, on, so where could you imagine kind of crypto payments being five years time? Right now it's probably you know, barely registering, I would think. Yeah. But in five years, what, what could you imagine? Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it's I, I, we acknowledge it's very nascent at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I think what we think will happen over time is as more and more users come into the crypto ecosystem, right, there's a trend of 100 million to 300 million and more. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we start to evolve beyond the use cases that are purely investment oriented in many cases. Um, and, and that will happen on not just on the back of crypto. It will happen on the back of how user behaviors are changing. Yes. Right? Commerce is becoming more and more digital. Right? Our lives are becoming more and more digital. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think if you start to think about how merchants will tackle that user who wants to do everything digitally going forward, they will find that crypto payment type of products will be very attractive. Uh, you know, users would want to use them. They would offer uh, a, you know, high all, all the metrics they're looking for, right? High conversion yeah. rates, low costs, et cetera. Yeah. Um, that's where I see it going. Okay. Uh, I, I do see it becoming, you know, from the data we see from our, our not just our, like our, our Visa prepaid card as well as, 
you know, the interest we're seeing from large merchants wanting to adopt crypto payments. Um, you know, there's, there's B2B payments. We're getting asked about, like, invoicing capabilities on okay. crypto. So these are the kinds of trends I think really will continue to evolve here. Yeah. I need to read the words because I was struck by the mission statement. So I just need to read the words to make sure um, I've, I've got this correct. But the mission statement uh, for crypto said that um, it, it confirms your desire to, and these are quotes now, to help develop a fairer and more equitable digital ecosystem. That's and right. I just wondered, what, what does that look like? Um, what, what does that... Look, we, we were formed on a belief that all the users need to be empowered with control, control over their money, control yeah. over their data, and control over their identity. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we think that the technology that we're working with offers much more enablement and empowerment towards that belief. Right? Um, we feel that traditional systems, um, in some ways, are, are legacy today. Right? They're, uh, they're expensive. Um, in many cases, quite slow, yeah. and, and starting to get antiquated a little bit. Okay. Um, and, and so, um, I, I think that that uh, that looks like a scenario where, when when something like that happens, when you see a system start to get uh, more expensive and more antiquated, uh, it starts to leave people behind. Okay. Um, and and that's kind of what we want to see change. Okay. Um, so, we you know when we say fair and equitable, we see an environment where people have that control. Uh, and empowerment, uh, and it's universal. It's available to everyone. Yeah. That's super interesting. It's a, re it's a really bold vision. We need to wrap now, perhaps one last question, if I may. So I, I know you do, I'm not sure it's quarterly releases, but I remember reading a, a quite a big piece on the amount of product enhancements or product developments that you did in one, in one batch, one bucket, really. And there was one commentator on LinkedIn who, who commented that, uh, asked the question, don't you guys at crypto.com ever sleep? <laughs> and I just realized that, it, it, does it feel like that sometimes? <laughs> yeah, crypto never sleeps, right? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, no, I think uh, we do sleep. Um, but look, I think uh, it's a very exciting time to be doing yeah. what we're doing. Um, and you know, there's a ton of opportunity. And like I was telling you, our, our goal is to be able to try different things in this space and form that narrative for our users. Um, so, and, and we are also excited because it's so early uh, in the adoption cycle at the moment. Yeah. Um, even though we, you know, there's so much buzz and so much discussion going on about the crypto industry, you know, from an adoption perspective, from a use case perspective, it's just so early days. So yeah. we're, we're super excited about it. Uh, but yeah, we do get some sleep. <laughs> it's Listen, thank you for coming to share your thoughts today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Abby. Thank, thank you. Thank you thank very much. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. I'll catch you in a minute, perhaps. Thank you. Um, right, so I'll uh, just our last bit. For, apologies for keeping my mask on there. I'm still getting used to mask on, mask off. Well, forgive me for talking in the first couple of minutes uh, with my mask on. So I'd like to introduce my, our guest for our last uh, fireside chat now, uh, Rosalia Gitto, who's the CEO of uh, Bixi. So we're just going to explore with Rosalia her new proposition. Hello. Welcome to the stage, Rosalia. Thank you. Hello. There we go. Okay. So I'm not sure how much or how many of our audience will, will have a, a good working knowledge of Bixi. Perhaps if I could start off with you explaining an overview of, of the company and your proposition. Well, I mean, I would be surprised because our product isn't available here, uh, but, but it will be soon, ladies <laughs> in the room. Um, so Bixi is a, an application, it's a mobile application, and it's a financial platform where we connect women who are interested in beginning your investment journey with the knowledge, network, and tools necessary to trigger investment action. And so, so great summary. That sounded, that, that sounded like you might have said that once or twice. Once or twice. <laughs> That's the lift pitch, I think. Is, yeah. is that what they call it? Or the elevator pitch. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the insights that powered it? I'm always interested in new ideas and where you got yeah. the insight to create this idea from. How did that come um, Both, you know, my, my personal late start in, into investment. Um, but really, I, it, you know, I think sometimes we, we create careers um, that we don't necessarily intend. So I'll begin at the beginning. I was a lawyer. Um, I was a, finan a capital markets attorney, and I never in my life thought, why, how would this be pertinent in my life to be looking at you know, regulations on capital markets? I soon left that career and started working with the United Nations, where I spent okay. almost two years, or sorry, almost 10 years. Um, and my work was principally building or strengthening existing female networks. Uh, why? Because when you are providing resources for crisis-affected populations, women are actually the best vessel in which to invest if you want to see uh, growth in GDP and attendant growth. So I became really adept. I'd done it in 25 countries, and I became really adept at 
building large women's networks. Um, I subsequently created my own nonprofit. It's uh, the Humanitarian Women's Network, so we're the largest uh, women's network in the world. Um, and I kind of started seeing the writing on the wall. The humanitarian industry, it's a $30 billion a year industry. Um, a lot of how we do our work, which is principally just logistics, right? It's logistics in places where markets can adapt. Um, it was pretty antiquated. Um, and I started finance, working in the Syria crisis. I was a head of analysis. Um, and I started financing startups because it was one of the first ecosystems where we actually had tech actors. Um, you know, prior to that, I was working in true last mile, like Western Central Africa, intermittent internet connections. Uh, GSMA was actually a partner to uh, my UN agency because in some places we had to get satellite connections and you know leverage yeah. leverage that. Yeah. Um, so I started financing these startups, and um, I kind of turned my office into an incubator, much to the chagrin of my colleagues. Um, so I, you know, when I hear about the, the 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 large telcos, you know, struggling to innovate, I can understand that because the United Nations is itself a very very large organization that, yep. that struggles to innovate. So yeah, I started financing them, brought them in house, and caught the bug, and really saw that this might be not only a process that really attracted me. Um, in terms of identifying a problem, finding a solution, iterating, uh, but that we could really start to see some impact. So I quit my, well, I didn't actually quit. I was highly discouraged to quit because I was a senior UN official. So I wrote a letter to the head of our organization in New York, and I said, you know, can I have a year off so I can uh, learn about, you know, um, innovation and technology and bring this back into the humanitarian sector? And they said, okay, I asked for two years, and they said, no, no, we'll give you one. Um, and so that was six years ago. I haven't gone back, but you know, pending. Um, and I found my, it was 2017, and it was the height of ICOs, and I found myself at a crypto company. I was really attracted to the ethos of democratizing access to finance, right. the decentralized aspect of it. I really thought, Hmm, this could be an interesting solution to address you know, the challenges that millions of women around the world were facing. Um, and then from there, I got recruited to join an Alipay team in Hangzhou, China, where I don't speak Mandarin. Um, but the woman starting the team, she was from an investment bank at JP Morgan. Okay. Uh, she had been an early investor into a startup that I, that I kind of kicked off and began with. Right. Um, joined her team, and that was my big aha moment. I learned all about the power of aggregating large groups of people onto a financial platform. I saw how it could really benefit uh, the end user, and also, you know, obviously, anybody, everybody knows, you know, hugely profitable for a company. Um, and I learned a lot in, in my time at China, and I thought, okay, I need, well, you know, the, the business model is thus. Who is, it? find a group of people, aggregate them onto a platform, and then our job was always to link up with you know, the, the, the finance aspect at the back, um, and then to split the difference with the end user. And I thought that was, that was a really interesting solution. So I took that, I started thinking, I started think ideating, working with a financial alliance for women. Um, I knew that there was one very large group in the world who was completely disenfranchised from finance, and that was women. We're 51% of the world, yet we own less than 30% of the world's wealth. Um, so I knew that that was a market gap. I didn't really understand the extent of that market gap. Um, I started ideating with Financial Alliance for Women. You know, traditional financial institutions aren't even collecting gender data systemically. Right. Um, so they, uh, you know, they don't even realize the extent of, of the problem. Um, and the extent of problem is pretty vast. Fewer than 1% of the women in the world invest. And even in advanced markets, the numbers are still you know, under 30%. Um, and this is not only to our own detriment. So there's you know, the wage gap, but the investment gap is also hugely detrimental to us. Um, but it's a $3 trillion market gap, just in traditional finance, not counting DeFi. So that was how Bixie was born. Bixie is... Uh, Please correct me if there's varying interpretations, but the female feng shui symbol for wealth generation. You've probably seen it all over Singapore, those little lines in front of houses or buildings. Uh, the smaller one on the right, that's the big C. The left is the male Pichu. Uh, so I'm trying to bring wealth into the lives of women around the world. And uh, we launched our MVP in the Philippines uh, earlier this year. And it has been, you know. Why, why the Philippines? 
for many reasons. I happen to be half Filipino and Kenyan. Um, but when I was drafting my two market strategy, uh, which was an Excel spreadsheet, I looked at three issues. I looked at two. One was regulations over electronic money and depositors. Okay. Number two was uh, amenability to crypto because I knew that that was, you know, DeFi is the future. Yeah. Um, and I looked at high inflation which a year and a half ago, which is when a year ago when we started Bixi, wasn't so much of a global problem. Um, and why I looked at high inflation was because I know that, you know, that was going to be the trigger, one of the triggers to action. You know, it's one thing to know you have to invest. It's another thing to realize hmm, my money is quickly, you know, dissipating. I need to start investing to at least, at least meet parity. Right. And what was the proposition for your MVP that you took into market? Uh, the proposition was knowledge, network, and tools. So uh, our supposition, and it's all backed by, you know, I did evidence-based research, lit reviews for six months prior to incorporating Bixie, and there are a number of ways that women interact very differently than men when it comes to money. We agree that, you know, when it comes to mating and dating, women behave differently. But money is an even more intimate resource. Um, I can inquire after, you know, the name of your wife or lover, but I can't really inquire after the number in your bank account, right? For a lot of, for a lot of women. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we accept that, that women interact very differently than when it comes with money. And actually a lot of the anthropo, there's a lot of anthropological reasons. There are behavioral and emotive reasons. I'm primed to notice these things because prior to going to law school, I did my master's in behavioral economics. So when I see something like 99% of women aren't investing, I don't just think, oh, well, it's because they're risk averse, because that was generally the, the knee-jerk right. industry reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I think something deeper is going on there. And a lot of it was behavioral. So a few examples, um, women don't invest because we lack confidence, and we lack confidence because we perceive that we lack literacy. So that first step of unlocking it is I have to give you knowledge, right? I have to create a semblance of you feeling confident in that knowledge in order to start triggering. The second really key distinction, and this is anthropological, like back in the cave, um, is uh, we tend to make our decision by t financial decisions by talking to our peers uh, rather than financial experts. So like suits and austere buildings, that's not going to trigger us to reactions. We right. actually go to our friends and we're like, what do you think? Um, and, um, and the third thing is when it comes to emotions, when men interact with money, they feel a sense of shame. Um, so it's no surprise that, you know, it's confidentiality and secrecy is, are the dominant responses in, in financial services. Um, but we experience anxiety. So the question is, where are kind of the attendant, you know, uh, scented candles or, or mood lighting? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not being trite about that. Um, the medical industry is actually recognizing this and, and they're, they're, be, they're changing, you know, the lighting and, and the smells inside of rooms to get women to take better, you know, personal health, particularly on, on pregnancy journeys. So I think by us tapping on these behavioral and emotive distinctions, we are looking to unlock that, that $3 trillion market gap. So our MVP proposition is knowledge yep. to build confidence, network to make de-risk decisions uh, with a community of peers. Um, and then once they're feeling confident and mitigated risk, then we present a marketplace of licensed financial products from partners. And where is the proposition now? Is that, that MVP that worked? And this is the, what you said now, that's the new proposition in market? Is it? No, no, that's what's working. That's what we have in as a test, as our MVP. Uh, okay. um, the beta, the alpha, and the beta is really just about attaching more and more products in terms of the tools that we offer. I see. So Payment Wallet is starting this month through licensed partners. Okay. Then we want a crypto fiat wallet. Um, we have our learn to earn platforms. So this is, you know, pre-release of our, our, our utility token for our users so that they'll be encouraged to learn more. Yeah. Um, but of course, we're going to be listing our token, you know, when the uh, when the markets show, you know, show okay. more interest. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's we have a lot lined up in our roadmap. So unfortunately, we're out of time. But um, tell me, so in 12 months time, what's what's your goal for 12 months? If we were sitting here in 12 months time reflecting on a good year, what would that good year have been? Well, um, I want every woman in this room to have downloaded the app. <laughs> um, but more importantly, <laughs> because we were, we're looking to expand beyond the, Phil <laughs> <laughs> beyond the Philippines, we want to move to, to Southeast Asia. We're already in talks with uh, financial service providers here in Singapore for okay. this regional expansion um, because we work through licensed partners for the financial yeah. products. Yeah. But more importantly, um, we track, uh, you know, our, our mission is to empower women to know our worth and to grow our worth. And we track how you're doing financially. And I, you know, I, I personally want to see women 
in increasing their net worth on our platform. So in a year, if you start, at the end, I want to see you actually earning money. Fantastic. Listen, I, we, do, we do need to wrap up, as you can see, it's gone red. <laughs> but it, it's fantastic. Thank you for coming and Thank sharing you. your thoughts as Rosalie. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Uh, so just a, a, a final couple of wrap-up slides, if I, if I may, please. It's showing on this screen. Is it going to? There we go. Um, so just in terms of kind of the work today uh, and, and the session that's following this. So uh, work at the GSMA on fintech and the mobile economy. We do an awful lot of work. Today we're in Singapore. Uh, we work with colleagues all over the world. So we are um, doing a kind of fintech summit in, in Africa. We're also going to uh, similarly to support colleagues in North America and Las Vegas in September. And the work on our big event, which is in February in Barcelona, has already started. So if you and your organizations are in any of those markets or interested in Barcelona, which is the big global one, uh, do reach out. Really happy to explore. Um, all, all those events work similar to today. We get great partners in who showcase the fantastic work they're doing and on leave us all inspired, which is how, exactly how I feel at the moment. Um, in terms of, we, we also have a kind of fintech, uh, a, a fintech group that we pull together digitally, which is a member-based group. On the right-hand side there, you can see just the way we framed it about six, eight months ago to start to explore some of the key areas. So um, do get involved, do ra reach out for me or my colleagues if you'd like to explore being involved in any of those things. And, and finally, uh, just wanted to again uh, reiterate that um, in half an hour's time is our FinTech Summit uh, and a big thanks to Decomo and again to all our speakers today. I felt it found personally a really inspiring session, some fantastic presentations and uh, a big thank you to, uh, once again to all our speakers. Thank you. And we'll see you a bit later if you can join us. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.